see if this thing works. They had it working, so it's got to work, right? All right, I'm going to walk over here. So thank you for the introduction, guys. I really appreciate that. Um, this is actually my third time speaking here with uh, the Columbus Web Group. The first time actually was about implementing animations into product and web and all that sort of thing. And then uh, the second piece was about uh, prototyping. And I gave that last year. And it's a blast to be a part of this. So the first thing, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. There's a lot of things you could be doing tonight. And you chose to be here. And I think that that's really amazing. Not so much just to come see me speak, but to be a part of this community, which is you know, something that Kevin and Adam made in the basement of Resource a long time ago. So uh, I, I feel pr privileged and honored to be a part of that uh, group of people. So. Little intro, little agenda. You know, we have to have all these slides to let you know what's going to happen. There is going to be a little bit of a different thing with this. I, I shortened down this talk. I'm going to cover a lot of things, but I'm, I want to leave a lot of time at the Q and A at the end um, because of the topic that we're on. So the idea of like questioning everything, I want you guys to feel free to question me, have a discussion, and uh, open it up. So remember those things in your head as, you, as we're going through, and uh, get ready to ask some questions at the end. So who the heck am I? Travis James McCleary. I've lived in a lot of different places. I was born out in uh, the West Coast, but I've lived the majority of my life here in the Midwest. I've uh, been in nine, city, or nine states, uh, 17 cities, 32 moves. It's been a lot. And most of the time, these moves are for work or for my parents when they were moving around for work. And I've had a total of 25 jobs through that experience. I calculated last night that I basically have had a steady job for more than half of my life now, which is pretty wild to think about. But I've done anything from uh, scrubbing dishes to working on an assembly line, building cabinets, uh, to being a projectionist at a movie theater. Now, I, I'm pretty lucky uh, that I've had a pretty awesome support structure. Uh, my family, my, my, my parents are, are amazing individuals. They uh, have their own small business while my dad does that. and has a full-time job at a centrifuge plant down in southern Ohio. Now, you want to talk about like true grit of being able to get something done, and like that Midwest mentality is in those two people right there. My dad is a natural problem solver and will take on anything, and my mom is just like no holds barred, won't take shit from anybody. So it, it's a it's an amazing pack, uh, pack between the two of them. And then uh, my brother, <clears throat> uh, he is way smarter than me, way more talented than I am, and uh, has always pushed me. And he's one of the few people that I could go to in the early stages of my de design career and get like really honest feedback. Because I kind of feel like a lot of times when you're starting out, everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's good, and you, like pat you on the head and move along. But he was there to like call me out. And I, was I really appreciate that. So if you guys check him out, uh, clearmedia.com. He's here in Columbus as well. So besides that, I'm also a father. And what's been really interesting about uh, these Columbus web groups, the last time, the very first time I gave a talk, I just became a new father. And the second time, I found out that I was going to have a second kid. And now, I'm, I, this third time, I've moved back to Ohio, and I'm going to share a little bit about this. So being a father is pretty wild, and it's amazing, and it, you know, there's all the cliche aspects of that. But uh, the thing that I found is that there's a lot of ups and downs, and it's a lot about patience and trying to, like, Put yourself in somebody else's shoes, like le legitimately trying to understand where this, this tiny human being is coming from. But you know, with the ups comes the downs. And the best way to get away from the downs is by dancing. Lots and lots and lots of dancing. But I, you know, I always wonder you know, what people want to share and why they want to share it. And for me, the reason why I share it is that this right here. This is everything to me. And, and you know, we do a lot of work. We, uh, we do a lot of play and everything. But really what I want to be known for, the things that I care about, is about being an awesome husband, being an awesome father, being an awesome friend to the people that are out here. You know, the work side of things, that's one thing. But this is what really matters to me. And you shouldn't take yourself too seriously. I mean, we literally push pixels on screens all day, guys. Like, there's no reason to, like, be all bottled up with all this stuff. Like, take a step back and look at the fact that you are lucky enough to like press buttons like this all day instead of doing, you know, super manual labor or you know, be impoverished and everything. Like this, this is we're pretty fortunate to have these types of jobs. So, the real reason why you guys are here, 
questioning everything. So when I go through these to topics, like I said in the previous ones, they were very tactical, like learn how to put animation into your work, learn how to bring prototyping in. And I wanted to see about something that was a little bit more outside the scope, a little bit more broad uh, for a reason that, you know, what is the number one question I get is like, how do you go from point A to point B in your career? What are the, the things that are going on to be able to make you successful, blah, 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 all these things. But the one skill that stays true through all of that for me is the ability to ask a question, receive an answer, and do something with it. So uh, I'm going to go through these aspects and try to tell you like how I learned and grow, grew through stories and that sort of thing. So I'm going to share a little insight from me. And then at the end, again, feel free to ask me questions. So I know what you're thinking. One doesn't simply ask questions, but why is that? And it's based off of fear, you know, the idea of like being rejected and all the things that come along with that, feeling like you don't know what you're doing. And it reminds me of, of uh, another reason, sorry, but. Whenever I go out to bars there, I ask one friend of mine, he's one of these guys who's like, oh man, any cute girl you see, just go talk to her, man. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Any cute girl you see, just say something, anything. It doesn't matter what. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? I'll tell you what's gonna happen. That girl is gonna be mean as shit to me for no reason at all. Why do I wanna deal with that? So I get it, right? I get it. There are a lot of assholes out there, but there are way more people that are awesome. And there's a, probably a good chance that the person that's sitting next to you is an awesome person. They chose to be a part of this. They chose to be a part of this community. Invest in that. Invest with the people that are beside you. Um, now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you won't run into people that are dicks, right? And they're, they're, they, they won't give you that point in time or anything. But, you know, brush them off. You, nine times out of ten, you're going to be able to find that mentorship or the answers that you need. Now, a very general sense, I think there's like three major types of questions that can be asked. And the first one being what? And the most stereotypical what question I can think of is what the hell am I doing with my life? Now, everyone experiences that in college. I experienced it at Shawnee State in Southern Ohio. Now, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life at this point in time. I had some background in uh, building computers, some understanding of code. I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to do film. I wanted to be in art, but thought there was no money in it. Doing all these things. So I started out as a computer engineer. And I'm sitting there you know, building things and typing on a screen and watching the, the, this ball move across the screen in a class, this, this first uh, engineering class, and thinking, there's no way that I'm going to do this. Like, I can easily do this, this actual action of repeating textual questions over and over and over again, but I'm not getting any fulfillment out of it. There's no instant gratification out of watching this ball move back and forth. I want something more. And I didn't know what to do, so I I, I kind of proposed that this thought that like I'm going I'm going to go into art like I'm, I get something out of this I want to create something and feel connected to that so my dad someone that owns a golf business builds golf clubs and also is a nuclear engineer uh, I you know very rational individual very logical based I go to him and I have this very specific memory in my head while he's making golf clubs cutting you know, sparks are flying and all that good stuff and saying like all right. I'm going to quit this very lucrative job opportunity and go into art. And I prepared this long, lengthy debate, thinking that we were going to, we were going to battle over it. And he turned and looked at me and said, Is it long, as long as it has to deal with computers, I'm fine with it. That was it. So I, instead of debating me anymore, I left that room and went directly back to Shawnee State and, and found somebody and said, hey, tell me what art program deals with computers. And they said, design. And I was like, OK. Sign me up. Literally went and signed up for every design class I possibly could get my hands on. Now, before that, all I'd ever used was MS Paint. I had never had worked on a, on a Mac. I had never worked on any Adobe product. That was my love and joy right there. You know, making band posters off of that thing. That's what all I needed. All I needed was those, those colors right there and those little tools. And, and you know, I, my first class, I sit in a room full of these things and go, I don't even know where the power button is on this thing. Like, I don't even know how to use the, the OS. I don't know what's going on. And, I'm, and I immediately just go, <laughs> freaking out, man. Like sitting in a room with all these people that are on there, you know, messing with the pen tool, editing photos and everything. And I'm just like, 
I've, there's no way I'm going to make it through this. But that led me into the next, is the how. So how the hell am I going to get through this? How am I going to become a designer? But first off, how am I going to turn this thing on? So I turn to somebody and I say, hey, I'm really sorry to bother you, but can you, sh can you show me how to use this thing? And that was my first connection at school to be able to like really find out that like even when you're at your most vulnerable, there's probably someone out there that's got, a, got some knowledge that they can share with you, like pressing a button. And that kind of came to me spending a lot of time in this building, this art building that had all the computers and spending time just grinding out as much as I possibly can and bothering every single person. I found that the most important piece about asking these questions and bothering people is being humble but also being genuine. Now, you gotta imagine that you're taking someone's time out of their, like, they're busy doing something and you're asking something out of them and, and giving them nothing in return. So all I went through every single time was like, hey, I'm sorry to bother you. Do you have a moment to show me how to do this? Do you have a moment to critique this piece? And kept on going and going and going. And if they said, sorry, no, I can't do it or whatever, I'd be like, all right, that's no problem. But if you ever need anything, come and find me. And, and make them know that, that there's a, that opportunity. And the problem with that is that there's only a limited amount of students that go to a school, right? And if you want to really brighten your, your horizons, you kind of lean on the internet. Now, while I was working on a, a project, I came across an artist. Uh, this is Aaron Scamahorn's work, this guy right here. Now, he had posted this piece right here, and I had really wanted to learn how to make all the textures and all the pieces and all the aspects that make this piece really great. And, you know, again, thinking of the Z's uh, joke, I, I really was like, what? Like, he's going to turn me down. There's no reason why I should invest in this. Like, I'm talking to my wife and saying, like, what should I do? And she's just like, what, what, can, what could happen? He's going to say no. You don't know this guy. What's the worst that can happen? And so I reach out to him, and I start talking, and, I, and, and I, there's, a, there's kind of this trick of like when asking somebody something, especially when you don't know them, isn't just come straight out the door and say, how did you do this? Please tell me how. But quoting it into the, I really love your work. I really appreciate all the attention to detail, and then trying to find some connection with somebody. Now, I think we take a lot of that stuff for granted, especially on the internet, but he really took the time and effort and showed me how to do the things I wanted to do, and I was lucky enough to be able to create this, this piece here. Now, it was a lot of back and forth, and back at that time, it was really hard to send massive files back and forth to each other, but he took the time out of his day to show me how to do this stuff, and I, I was internally grateful for it. And that was kind of like the first step at realizing that like, this, the internet was open enough, and there was enough people on it to be able to like, really help me, and were willing to do so. Now, 2007 rolls around, and all hell breaks loose. And I start hearing people say, like, be prepared not to find a job. Be prepared to default on your loans. Be prepared for this and that. And I was like, there's no way. I'm going to get a job, and I'm going to figure out how to do this. So I started, again, asking everybody I could find. You know, people that are out in the field, people that were my mentors at school, and asking, how do you do this? And the number one thing that came back was, Grind as hard as you can grind, take any job you possibly can take, and make sure that your portfolio does not have anything related to school in it. And the reason being is that everyone does the same projects. So when you go out and you share the, your book with somebody, they can see like the movie posters, the CDs, the this and that, and you're not going to stand apart. So even if the work is not great, it will at least show that you had the grit to go out and get the work in the first place and talk to the stories about what happened and the case studies behind it, not just the flashy imagery. So I begged, borrowed, and stole, and, and ran into uh, this professor, Matt Cram, and I said, man, I really need to get some work. What can you do for me? And he started giving me scraps, logo projects, this and that. And then one thing led into another, and I got a full pay gig job with making advertisements for above urinals. That was the job. So if anybody ever says they've had the worst job in design, I will debate them fully on this right here. Having to say that going to a business and say, I can promise you X amount of impressions for this long period of time above a urinal, and then have to design to that. It's horrible. But it, the, the piece about it that I learned was how to pitch, how to do stuff really quickly, how to re rely on your instincts in that piece. 
that job led to another job, led to another job, led to another job, all based on the fact that I was willing to take on anything that someone would throw at me. There will always be a payoff, no matter what. You'll always learn something, even from failure. And I, I feel like we're now in this world where like, startups kind of play that up a lot, that like, failure is definitely the option, and so on and so forth. But really, it's about what are you getting out of it. And sometimes it's money, and sometimes it's experience, and sometimes it's, it's to learn to never interact with that type of person ever again. And it sucks that that has to happen, but it is part of what we do. Now, I get done with my college uh, experience, and I'm starting to look for a job, and this rolls around. So Mediasauce is a small design firm out in Indianapolis. And Aaron Skimhorn, that I talked about at the beginning, had worked there for quite some time, and he, he reached out to me and said, hey, I got this gig, are you interested? And now, <laughs> I'm willing to take anything at this point that is like an agency experience so I can actually learn from other people. And he was willing to like throw me this bone, you know? And so I, I get ready to you know, do my presentation, I get my book together, the iPad had just come out, I've been predating myself a little bit, and I put all my stuff on the iPad, I got a, I got a tie, I got up and, and I was super stoked, drove all the way from Columbus to Indianapolis, three hours, and I get there, and I'm greeted by this guy. Now, in my head, I had this picture of what a creative director was. You know, like this very sharp dressed individual that wasn't going to uh, curse or be vulgar in any way, and was just going to want to talk about typography and like little, little bits here and there. And I'm greeted by him. This is Mike, one of the best dudes that I've ever met in, in the design field, and one of the most talented. And we sit and talk for a full hour. And the whole time, I'm wondering, he's not asking for my book. He's not, he's not interested in my work. He's just kind of playing around with me here, like, what's going to happen? So I ask, like, hey, do you want to see my work? And he responds to me with, all this stuff's been vetted. Like, you got through, if you're meeting with me, that means you've done something right. What I'm trying to figure out right now is who are you? You're going to be sitting with me eight hours out of the day, 40-hour plus week. And he's like, no, it's actually more like 60 hours a week. And... I'm going to be spending more time with you than I am with my wife. So can I handle sitting with you for an hour, hour and a half? And the answer was yes. So I ended up working with these guys. And, you know, a lot of people say this, but it's 100% it's true. Your first real job out of school will be more learning than anything that you learned in your four, five, six years at school because you're put into stressful situations that you have never experienced. And luckily, I was surrounded by guys that were willing to help me out. Now, through that, the most important thing I found out was that you've got to trust your gut when you're in a space like agency environments. You've got to go as fast as you possibly can because you're on a deadline at all periods of time. So through that instinct, you get more speed and you get faster along. But the, the, the second part to that is that it's really, really easy to get down on yourself, especially when clients are just like trash your work. And a lot of like design is putting yourself out there and it was a lot about staying positive and having fun. Like again, like I said at the top, like being thankful that we get to sit here and press buttons all day and make cool shit. So now I think a lot of times people get up here and they and they kind of glorify their work experience and, and make it seem like my your path and your work experience goes in this trajectory, like more money, more responsibility, so on and so forth, and it works like this. But that's it just doesn't work that way. After I left uh, media sauce, I went to a startup that was a small area in, in Indianapolis, and then I bounced from a startup to working at Resource, and I, and I did all these jumping around to find out what I wanted. It wasn't like this. It was this every single time, trying to figure out what I wanted to get out and, and what I wanted to learn from it. And I think that be mindful that it's not, it's definitely never a straight line in your work, work path. It's, it's all about what are you going to get out of it along the way and trying to learn from those, those uh, mistakes and the awesome stuff. And by and large, if anybody ever gets up in front of you and says that they have all the learnings and all the things in the world, that could, like this is how you're going to get successful, they're lying to you because there's no secret sauce. That The whole thing is about getting out there, doing the work, getting experience, and then moving on to the next thing. So start getting into the, the, the senior level like, area of my career and thinking like, what is it that I want to get out of this? Why am I still a designer? Why am I working on marketing? Or why am I doing this and that? And trying to really place like, some level of importance on the why. You know? And then, then this happened. 
and it changed the perspective of everything from that point on. It was a lot more about like, what am, what am I going to do to show my son that hard work and, and the character that comes along with these things really matters? And it really boiled down in my head that I want to be working on stuff that I can be proud of, not just from like, like it graphically looks good, but like the outcomes of the product, the things that I'm trying to push out to people matters. So you know, my first path after this was actually to move out to the West Coast and work for Evernote. And what had originally drew me to this was that they were doing product design, and I, and I wanted in on that. And they were also providing a tool, a very utilitarian tool inside an app. And you think about all the things that are on your phone these days with social media and all these like frivolous things, that this was like the most basic concept that was out in Silicon Valley. And I felt like this resonated 100% with me. Now, my experience there was pretty short-lived, but um, one of the things that I thought I had to do when moving out to the coast was like this ability to prove myself and that there was going to be so much talent out there. And I was met with the idea that, no, it's not the, that is not the case. There, the talent shift is, is no different. The ha what happens is there's more of them tightly wound in one spot, but the level of creativity, the level of uh, being able to output code and all that stuff is exactly the same. So I challenge anybody that says that you need to go out to New York or, or the West Coast to do amazing work. It just isn't true. Um, but that's not to say that being out there can be awesome. Um, I, I left Evernote and then worked at Netflix. And it was one of the most eye-opening experiences of my career. And then not so much from like the design aspect of things, but how the company was run. So Netflix is a, da is a data and debate culture. Everything that you come up with, you go into a room like this that's this Coliseum effect and you pitch these ideas out to people before it even gets started. And it's a lot about what's the hypothesis? How are you going to track it? What does success look like? Those are the things that you talk about well before design even gets there. And designers are a part of that conversation, so are engineers. And it's really about figuring that aspect out. And, and really, the only way you can do that is through user testing and, and A-B testing. Now, I think a lot of times people use these as like the buzzwords of the world, you know, the, the things that kind of get out there. like the, you know, no one else is doing it, so you need to go and do it. But for a company like Netflix, this is the only way that you can progress, getting user testing environments together before it goes out into the world, and then being able to track it against a control and other designs. Now, while at, at Netflix, I was fortunate enough to meet this guy, Steve Johnson. He's the VP of design out there. And one of the things I struggled with uh, while out in the Bay Area is that you start to look around and you see a lot of people that look like me. And there isn't a lot of diversity. Now, as a, a white male, it is very hard for me to really understand all the things that people of color and women and anything have to deal with because I've had a, a very privileged experience. Now, the only way that I feel like I can get anything out of this is by reading, by asking people questions. And somehow I had the guff to ask this guy, uh, what, like, why? Why does diversity matter? And we had a really close heart-to-heart -heart conversation about this exact thing. And, and he said it's not necessarily about like hitting some type of quota of like, we have to have so many women and so on and so forth, but it's about the perspectives that these individuals provide. And that, you know, working for a large company like Netflix or even working for a startup, the more diverse your, your perspective is, the more diverse the output of the work will be. And you think about anything that you do as a designer or a developer is based off of experience. Now those experiences can be something in college, but it can also be something that you experienced as a kid growing up. And you're only gonna get that if you surround yourself with other people that don't look like you. Now, I don't pretend to know how to, to fix this problem, you know, but and now being in a, in a space where I get to hire people, I get to, part, get to be a, a part of a culture and actually focus on this, I'm trying to do my best. So if anybody out there has any insights or any suggestions on how to fix this problem, come find me afterwards. Now at Netflix, I got to do a lot of things that I thought I would never do in my career. I got to work with Jim Henson. I got to work with this big hairy fella and make a video game inside of uh, a vi video content. I also got to work with uh, DreamWorks to build a choose-your-own-adventure experience uh, inside Netflix as a whole. And the, the question that I always get is, why leave? And it's, it's a very tough and complex answer, but a lot of it has to do with the family and the draw that I have to the Midwest. There's something to it 
that, that has always called me back. I've left multiple times and been put back at this position. But the second part being, I got to meet this guy. Alex Tim is the CEO over at Root. And you know, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of pitches. When you're out in the Bay Area, that's all you ever do. If you go out to dinner, you go grab a coffee, someone's there waiting to pitch you an idea. And they don't ever feel genuine. And they don't feel like they actually ever care about it. They're just looking for some type of payout. But with Alex, his passion was super infectious. The first call, the second call, him trying to really get me to come out here and thinking like, you know, what am I gonna get out of this opportunity? What am I gonna provide to Root? And the answer is the ability to influence a company at a level that I had never experienced for. Be able to shape the culture and the way that people work. Like working at Netflix is amazing, but it's a machine that already exists and it's gonna keep on moving with or without me, right? And the tests that we run, we're talking about minuscule amounts of uh, effective change. You know, we're we're small small punk, puncture, um, you know, decimal points in the the grand scheme of things. But at root, there's ten people. Everybody's going to be doing the same thing. We're all moving towards this one goal, and I was going to have an opportunity to be a part of that. Now, you know, I've been asked a lot of times, like, what is root and how to explain this, and I've you know, this is what it is right here. And uh, I'm going to share guys a, a video with you guys to, to explain it even further. Hey, you know what nobody's ever said, like, ever? Man, I love my car insurance company. That's because they all suck. So you're buying insurance, right? Filling out about a trillion different form fields, literally page after page after page. Now, how many of these questions have to do with, oh, I don't know, your actual driving ability? That's a big fat zero. Let's be real. There's only one reason they ask these questions, to put you in some arbitrary category. And once they box you in there, it doesn't really matter whether you're a good driver or not. Because when your neighbor, Mr. Too Fast, Too Reckless, crashes into the drive-through at 2 a.m., well, who's gonna wind up paying for that? That's right. You are. That's how car insurance has worked for decades. And the insurance companies don't care what you think about it because the old system works just fine for them. I mean, that's the thing, right? You don't have a choice. You need car insurance. It is literally illegal to drive without it, but the insurance companies don't have to care about fare because they have all the power and all the control. Well, that is bullshit. Isn't anybody out there doing things differently? Well, yeah, there's Root Insurance. Root cares about that oh-so-rare concept in the insurance industry, fairness. Instead of basing your rate solely on these, it charges you primarily based on one thing, how you drive. Crazy, right? You just download an app and drive around for a few weeks, then Root's artificial intelligence runs the numbers. Since Root doesn't insure guys like Speedy McLeadfoot over here, you don't pay for their accidents. When you get your personalized quote, it could be up to 52% less than what you're paying now. And the whole experience is totally modern. No massive pages of questions, just a streamlined process right through the app. They'll even cancel your old policy. It's how insurance should be. So seriously, stop settling, download the Root app, and get car insurance without the bullshit. So I've covered quite a bit, you know, from the beginning of my career to now, and an update on the things that are going at, at Root. So I started back in December of last year. It's closing in on a full year. I started out as being number 10. We're well over 50 people now. Uh, we started out in uh, offering insurance in one state. By the end of the year, we'll be in 13 states. Uh, it's, it's growth that I've never seen at any place. And, you know, the things that... I used to get really excited about being a part of the product and being like, you know, pushing out the pixels and, and being part of that process. I still love that aspect of things, but what I love even more is being a part of getting designers in, getting developers in, and helping them be awesome at what they do, removing roadblocks from them, and hearing the questions they ask me, and me being able to share some insights to, you know, the experiences that I have. And I, and I really value that more than anything now as in my new position as Chief Creative Officer. So uh, as I pointed out, I've covered all kinds of different topics for you guys. And uh, this would be the Q&A part of this. So um, everything's fair game. Let me know what you think. And uh, let's start with the next, the very first question. This guy right Yep. Hi. Um, 
Is that you in the video? And if not, then who is it? <laughs> His name's Joe, and no, I am not the guy in, in the video. <laughs> I mean, it does look a lot like me. It's fun. So at first, I just want to thank you for coming up here and speaking to us. Um, yeah. You know, you talk about making sure that we're seeing all perspectives. And I understand you said that you're trying to find a way to kind of have more, uh, basically finding those perspectives. What is your current method of doing that right now? Great question. So a lot of it is reaching out to networks like this and finding the people. Um, you know, a lot of what most design positions that are out there, or most positions out in the world, you'll find that uh, references are like the number one way to get into a place, right? So it's all about like the network that you have around you. So what I started out first actually was broadening my personal network to meet other people that were people that didn't look like me. And on top of that, trying to find other places, other like women uh, organizations, other organizations like that, and then try to be a part and understand what they're going through and then try to make sure that I don't repeat that at, the, at my workplace. And then other than that, it's just trying to push it out into the world like, hey, I'm looking for awesome people you know, and, and see what happens from there. Yeah, so the part at work is a great example. So we're lucky enough at, at Root to have um, a pretty even split of leadership is women and men. And I think that you know, what we strive for is making sure that that stays the way it is. And them going out and speaking to people and getting their in investment out into the world and trying to see if that we get some payoff from that aspect of things. The next part is also thinking about like when someone does come in an interview, what is that experience like? Like if it's a bunch of dudes like sitting around in a room, you know, talking about programming or something like that, like might turn off a lot of people from it and trying to understand that there's a lot that goes into the environment that you surround yourself with. And granted, like, you know, we do make up a lot of uh, engineers are, are white dudes that are sitting in our room, but we, we try to rectify that to the best of our abilities. Yeah. Yeah. Go. How do you manage work life balance? It's a very, very tough one. Um, I was pretty lucky again to uh, have mentors that had kids and like learn from them. So a lot of it is managing your schedule and managing expectations with the people that you work with. But I, I sad to say that you know what basically happens is I get home and my time is with my kids until they fall asleep. I try not to do any work as much as possible unless there's like some massive fire and. Then once they go to sleep, I try to answer some emails and put that stuff to bed and then wake up a little bit earlier. So I'm carving out a little bit more time out of my day to be able to do that. But um, I don't know that there is that perfect answer to it. Really, it depends on what are the needs of your family and the needs of your situation. So you know, I try to be there for in the mornings to help them get up and be there when they go to sleep. And that's if I can hit those two things, then I think that I'm in a pretty good spot. Um, but basically trying to manage expectations with the team is the, the hardest part. And luckily I have some really understanding people that work for me and work with me, so. Oh, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to ask uh, if you still reach out to people, like you reach out to that one artist mm -hmm. for insight on what to do next or yeah. design or anything at all, or if that was just because you were getting started. No, um, I actually just did a trip to California a couple weeks ago, and um, I used some of my network and the people I knew that were out there, but then I also just started reaching out to other people I didn't know. Uh, but it was very specific to uh, something that I needed, which was creative leadership and understanding how to affect culture. So I reached out to people at Facebook and Google and you know, got some meetings and didn't get some other ones. You know. Uh, I met with uh, Luke Woods, who's over at Facebook, a product designer. He's from Ohio, and uh, he was lucky enough to, or he, he's willing enough to, to give me his time to talk about that stuff. But basically, there's always someone out there that has more experience than I have in whatever thing that I need. And if I can go and talk to somebody, I'd rather do that than, than failing every single time on things that are pretty well known. So I, I will continue to do that, both, both in the field that's pertaining to me, but also something like, you know, doing that video, for instance, 
I have some background in film, but not enough to be able to do a full production like that. And reaching out to people in our area to see who's the best qualified to do this type of work and kind of going around that aspect of things too. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that you talk about, you know, reaching out to so many people in that kind of vein because, I mean, like, that's kind of why I'm here in the first place. Like, I reached out to Kevin Mack, you know, a number of months back, and that's how we met. And he said, you know, just come out to this event. Like, you'll meet just awesome people through it. And, like, that, I have nothing but, like, I, I entirely agree with that approach in general. Um, kind of earlier on, you were talking about your moves, you know, from job to job, from coast to coast, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm sure that part of it kind of involves, like, it just involves, like, failing at some point or another or, like, multiple different points throughout that. Was there, like, one move in particular that you're just like, oh, this is, this is horrible. Like, yeah. I just instant regret, yeah. and <laughs> in which case, how did you deal with that, and what was your kind of, like, key takeaway from yeah. that? So uh, to be super honest, um, moving out to California and getting that first gig at Evernote was really, really tough. Um, I think a lot of it was, you know, family driven, the idea that like, I'm a father, I'm totally separated from friends and everything back home, and I'm out here doing this thing that I think I, it's right for me, but is it right for like my family? And that was really hard. And then the, the job that I had really originally went out there for was to be a product designer. And I ended up being this like hybrid role between marketing and design because that's what they needed at mo that moment in time. I thought, like, I'm, am I actually getting the experience that I want to get out, out of this? And it was really, really tough. It was a really long 12 months working at, at Evernote and actually questioning, like, do I even want to be out here anymore in the Bay? And what am I getting out of this? And luckily, I had um, some, some uh, support out there. I met some really good people at Evernote. And uh, you know, a lot of people are moving on to other things. People jump around a lot out there. Even you know, I think this, the cycle out here in the Midwest is about two years, maybe a little bit shy of that. Out there, you're lucky to see if someone handles them a full year. Oh, wow. And so with that, I, I bounced over to Netflix, and I found the space that I wanted to be in. And it was really close between like, am I going to move back to experience something out here in the Midwest, or I'm going to keep it out there? And really, like. The only way that I found like any sanity with that like very tough problem was talking to people about it because there's no way that I could keep all that stuff stuck up here without going insane. So if if you do ever get in that situation, there's plenty of other people that, again that have, have experienced that and they can give you guidance on how to get get at, around it. I guess from that perspective, does that answer your question? Go. As far as talent acquisition for the for Root, you went mm -hmm. from 10 to 55. Mm -hmm. Are they from the Midwest? A. B, how do you make it sexy because it's car insurance? Mm -hmm. um, and is it a genuine pool of, of diverse, like, diverse employees? Like, kind of walk us through how, that's, that's a huge jump, especially yeah. in the Midwest, and I highly doubt they're coming from LA, New York, yeah. to the Midwest for, for I, what you guys are selling. No, yeah, no. yeah. I, I actually, I can't speak to it fully, but I believe a majority, if not like over 90%, are from the Midwest. And um, you know what is how do you, how do you pitch it? So the pitch that was given to me that resonated with me, and I can't s speak to everybody. I'm lucky enough to have some of the people from here, from Root here that you can talk to as well. But uh, the way I looked at it was the, the challenge, okay. the idea that this is a this is something that is required in every state, right? You're required by law to have insurance, and the fact that none of these companies have to do anything good for you because they know you need them. And that in itself was enough for me to be on board with that idea. Like, how do you change something? And I hate that, the concept of disrupting a, a, a big thing. Like that, you know, asso associating dollar amounts to like the, a, a space or whatever it is. I, I detest that to its fullest extent. But the idea that like the things you could do could actually impact people for the good. The idea that you know, disproportionately people are getting charged way more for their insurance and can I like affect that and be proud of that output. So that was what, what it was for me. Uh, I can speak to the people I've hired on the design team. That's what I talked to them about. I talked to them about that and I also talked to them about the impact that they can bring to the table. You know, being like one of the first designers or being a part of a design team that's like really flushing, flushing out like what design culture actually means at a company. Um, the diversity aspect, that's something that we are going to work on forever. 
I, I'd say that there's no point in time that I could say we're, we've got this right until like, there's way more people that don't look like me looking at, at Roots. So, um, yeah. You, uh, you touched on a couple times uh, some themes of like, courage and perseverance with uh, just getting work done or just asking questions from people who might give you uh, mean answers for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, and you also then just, in answering another question, talked about uh, talking to people when you, when you face a problem. But what, uh, what kind of questions do you ask? What kind of answers do you look for to help you decide, is this an Evernote and I need to leave? Or is this a Netflix and I should double down? That's a great question. So I think that the situational awareness that you're kind of alluding to is very difficult, right? It only comes with experience of like, am I in a, in a space that's gonna really like help me grow? So one of the things that I do through the interview process, like any time that I've ever gone out to a place, I've looked at the people that would be my leaders at, at the company. And if they have something to teach me, if they have a background that, and experience that I think is worth something, then there's probably a good chance that this is the right space to be in. Now, the thing with, with Evernote had more to do with the company dynamics that you're never going to see in an interview. Everyone ever puts on their, you know, the, their best clothes and kind of showcases this like perfect environment, but it, it never is as perfect as it seems. And that part is a little tough to figure out. I don't know that I have a great answer for that. I, and I, I guess I would say that even if you do fall into that category of landing into a job that you don't like, there's lots of opportunities out there and there's lots of people that are willing to like help you out with that aspect of things and you know, grind it out and then, and then find the next job and move on to the next thing. Um, hopefully that answers your question. If you want, uh, I can discuss more with you too. Go. So um, two things that are overwhelming clear from your talk is that one, you're incredibly kind and empathetic. And then the other thing is that you're a huge proponent of learning as you go, learning by doing, or like rising to the occasion of whatever that job requires. Yeah. And so as somebody who has these characteristics, when you're hiring, uh, I was wondering if that sort of background has an influence on how you look at potential candidates. Maybe you look for things that aren't necessarily on a resume, or do you have any like rules of thumb that you like to use as indicators of, you know, this, this kid might not have the strongest portfolio, but, you know, this is what I want in a candidate. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for the kind words first. Uh, yes, there's, there's lots, um, and I could talk forever about this, but I'll, I'll try to make it succinct and we can catch up later. But um, at first, when I first started doing this, I, I always kind of looked, I was looking for like this mere reflection of me, like the, all these kind of skill sets and the drive and all these things. And that's really unrealistic and unfair to the people that come in to do this. But the, the things that have always resonated with me is the willingness to learn and as, as cheap as it sounds, is like being willing to ask questions. Because in most cases, there are very few people that are actually qualified for the, the task that you actually have in place, right? So like if I go out and craft a, a job description and like here is all the things that I need in this moment, right? No one has this. Everyone will sit around in this like Venn diagram-esque of things. And really it's about what are those things outside of that circle are they going to be a benefit to us long term, or is it just something that's going to go wild, right? And really, the thing about like you know seeing someone's work and trying to understand where they're coming from is about asking them about how they came through the process of getting their book, their work to in front of me. I'm more interested in that most of the time than I am about the actual final output. The final output is the thing that catches you and makes you want to spend the time, right? But when it boils down to it, like my interview process isn't like come and bring me your portfolio. My interview process is give me case studies. What was the hypothesis behind the work? What did you learn from doing it? And, and what did the business learn from doing that, that work? And you, know, you may not have all the answers for that, but if you actually have an opinion or a thought on my, how that is, that's really good. Um, another part to our interview process and interview process that I've been a part of has been putting uh, candidates in slightly stressful situations. So in this presentation mode of like standing up and giving your case studies. I'll put developers and product managers and uh, copywriters in the room. They're gonna ask you questions that I as a designer am never gonna ask you. And it's about how you can respond to those questions and think on your feet and be a part of that conversation. 
And most of all is being able to answer, I don't know. Like if you can get across that and not fall flat on your face, it's probably a good chance that you could be a good fit to work with me or the team that I'm trying to build from that aspect. One more question. to this gentleman where you're talking about how you interview people and how you're throwing different people together and you're monitoring that conversation and whatnot, I kind of think you have the answer to the diversity problem by just doing it and I kind of wanted to hear what your reaction would be to those observations. I think I try, I, I'm trying and, and thank you for that observation. I, I think that there is some insight into that obviously but one of the problems is actually the funnel to get people in the door in the first place. Um, that is by far the hardest part. And I think that, you know, I've talked to, to larger companies uh, and like someone like a Nationwide or something like that will funnel up uh, interview, like basically any type of resume that like they can say like, oh, this is, you know, some minority or something to like, check off this list to say like, oh, at least we had this many people come in and like float them to the top of the funnel. And that seems really wrong to me in itself too, to like go and say like, oh, you're this token character that like we're, we're gonna have you come in and you're gonna have all the insights of everybody that's like you. And that's completely unfair as well. And I think that, you know, the question earlier about like networking and things of that nature, I've been just trying to like get out there, experience as much as I possibly can open the door and then bring that information back to my team and then keep, continue doing that aspect. But, you know, I think there's, what my observation, at least from the tech space, is that there's a lot of problems down at the educational level. Um, a lot of uh, what I've noticed is like, uh, especially women in tech, you get into that space where you're, you're coding and everything and it, there's a lot of bro culture, a lot of like the idea that you don't, you, we're gatekeepers to what we want to be and you don't know our silly references or any of these aspects of things, so you close the door on them instead of like being open and like giving them a chance. So why the hell would they even want to interview for a place if they know that that's kind of the world that they would be in? So I guess to some extent, like you know, what I can affect in the workplace is making sure that that stuff never happens or as limit, limited as much as possible. And then if you know. <laughs> If there's a program at Ohio State or CCD or anything like this that want people to be involved and try to get those individuals to come through, I think that's probably one of the better ways to get around that. Now, as for the craziness of like going out to somebody's like the, the completely different view set, I don't know that that's really worth my time or other people's time to be honest, because it's it's really tough. But like there is enough people out here that share my passion and love for type and film and all kinds of other things that again don't look like me that can provide that, that background. I'd rather find those people than maybe the people that just totally don't agree with me on anything else. So, yeah. OK, well, I'm going to be here for a while. Come and ask me more questions. I really appreciate you guys coming out. <laughs>